sign or the ring or the seal of the governor, of the ruler of the region. Here's what that meant. Anything that was sealed, if you got a letter and it was sealed, it had the governor's imprint, it meant you do not mess with this. You do not break this seal unless it is intended to you. And the punishment in those days for breaking the seal of the government was always death. Always, period. So the two-ton rock, he's all mummified, the four to 16 deadly soldiers, and the seal saying, mess with this, break this, and the punishment is death. Okay, so let's think about it. Here's the thought. Jesus never rose from the dead. The disciples came, and they stole the body. All right, now, the night that Jesus was arrested, the disciples, when they were eating dinner, you know, they were talking all tough. Peter said, Jesus, with you, I'm ready to be both arrested and killed. Jesus, I got your back. We're with you through this whole thing. Don't worry about a thing. Everyone's like, yeah, that's right, Jesus. We got your back, man. Don't sweat it, Romans. Psh, they come for you. We're coming for them. We ain't scared. We ain't sweating them. Man, they're talking all tough, right? Okay, Jesus goes to the garden with the disciples, and the Romans come to arrest them, and the end result was all of the disciples ran. Oh, forget about what we did. Oh, they all took off. Peter followed in a distance. Momentarily, he was brave. Remember, Peter pulled out his sword because he was still all jacked up. He's all juiced up from dinner. He pulls out the sword. Well, bam! Chops off that guy's ear. And Jesus goes, man, Pete. Jesus has to pick up his ear and put it back on the guy's head. If you're Peter, do you feel stupid right now? Jesus, I got your back. Check it out. And Jesus, oh, Pete, man, puts the ear back on the head. Why do you arrest a man who just put an ear back on a head? <laughs> I'm thinking the Romans were brave. I'm thinking they were good fighters, but I'm thinking they're dumb. <laughs> um, uh, you put the handcuffs on him. No, man, you put the handcuffs on him. <laughs> um, so the disciples ended up being cowards. In fact, John was the only one of the men who showed up to the resurrection. Here's a pinnacle of history. I know that I invited you guys kind of late to my son's birthday, so maybe not that many of you will show up. But Jesus told them for a long time in advance that he was going to be crucified. You think they would show up. You think his disciples, his followers, would be like, okay, yeah, we should probably go check this out. It's like the pinnacle of history, man. The Lamb of God on the cross. We should go check it out. They were so terrified, they didn't even show up for the gig. These men were cowards. And so here's what we're supposed to believe. All of a sudden, one day, they're like, all right, man. You know, we got to get our guts back. Man, Jesus is in the grave. We can't let this be. we got to go steal the body. All right, Peter, James, John, you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to jack up those Romans. Remember that ear thing I did? whack -ah! We're going to do it again. Man, we'll just start chopping off ears. And come on, we're bold. We're going to do it. Come on, no problem. Listen, no scraggly little fishermen are going to beat up four to 16 Roman soldiers and roll away the stone and steal the body. It just doesn't happen. They were cowards. But what about the women? The women showed up for the crucifixion. The women, that's what happened. The men were cowards, but the women came. And they said, man, I've been taking Taibo, Kwon Do, all that. I've been doing kick, 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 kick. The women came. Rose, I personally believe that the women would have had more of a chance than the men. <laughs> but I don't think that the women defeated the Roman soldiers and were able to steal the body either. Even if, let me give you a big, huge if, even if they did succeed in defeating the Roman soldiers and rolling away the stone and stealing the body and getting rid of it so that no one ever saw it, do you truly believe that all of those disciples would have died for that lie? Because that's what they did. After that, they left their homes, they left their families, they left their jobs, they left everything, and they went around the world talking about Jesus Christ. Would they leave everything and go around the world talking about a lie? Hey, man, I want to tell you about this Jesus guy. He's risen. <laughs> yeah, no, for reals. It's gnarly, dude. He was in the grave, and now he's not. Yeah, you should believe and get saved. <laughs> no. They might talk about it a little bit around Jerusalem and try to front, but would they die for it? 
Because 10 of the 11 were killed for their faith. And whenever one of them was killed, this was said to them, all you need to do is say, Jesus Christ is not Lord and we'll let you live. And they said, sorry, I saw him risen from the dead. What else could explain the change in the lives of the disciples from cowards who didn't even show up to the cross to men who went around the world preaching the cross other than the fact that they saw him risen from the dead? And maybe that one of them might have died for the lie. Not all of them. There's no way. You can't possibly believe that. The only way to account for their change is that they saw Jesus Christ. Now, remember what 1 Corinthians 15 said. We'll put it up here. Start in verse 3, which is 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. That's a first century euphemism for they're dead. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul speaking. There is the argument, well, everyone that he appeared to, they were all followers of Jesus Christ, so they were like hallucinating, you know? They all believed in him. They really wanted him to be raised from the dead, and so they just kind of conjured up in their little minds. I mean, these guys, they were probably so into communion. They probably drank so much wine at communion after this that they're like, man, I see the Lord. He's risen. Ah! People say that. People say, Jesus only appeared to his followers, and therefore we cannot believe his followers. I remind you that when Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, appeared to Paul, he was Saul, the Christian killer. He was not a follower of Jesus Christ. So you can't say, well, it's just the followers of Jesus Christ that said they saw him risen. Paul right there says, I saw him risen when he was a murderer of those who would follow Jesus Christ. Again, positive testimony from a hostile witness. So look at this next slide as we calculate where we are at this moment. The skeptic has to deal with these facts. The fact, number one, that the tomb was empty. Any human in Jerusalem could have denied it with a four-minute walk. Number two, that the seal was broken. Here's a little piece of history for you. This is a book that's out of print, and I'm sad it is because it's phenomenal. It's called The Resurrection Factor by Josh McDowell. There's a lot of books on the resurrection. This is probably, in my mind, the best one. It puts the resurrection of Jesus Christ on trial in a court of law, and sees if it'll stand up. It's out of print. If you want to find it, go to abebooks.com, and they search 8,800 used bookstores around the world. It's worth every penny. Listen to this from history page 60 of the resurrection factor with regards to the seal archaeology here in Nazareth a marble slab was discovered with a very interesting inscription a warning to grave robbers it was written in Greek and says this listen they found this they uncovered this they dug it up ordinance of Caesar it is my pleasure that graves and tombs remain perpetually undisturbed for those who have made them the cult of their ancestors or children or members of their house. If, however, anyone charges that another has either demolished them or has in any other way extracted the buried or has maliciously transferred them to other places in order to wrong them or has displaced the ceiling or other stones, against such a one I order that a trial be instituted." as in respect of the gods, so in regard to the mortals. For it shall be much more obligatory to honor the buried. Let it be absolutely forbidden for anyone to disturb them. Listen now. In case of violation, I desire that the offender be sentenced to capital punishment on charge of violation of the grave. First century stone dug up in Israel said this on it. Here's what um, historian Robert Meyer observes. He says this, All previous Roman edicts concerning grave violation set only a fine. 
And one would have to wonder what presumed serious infraction could have led the 